I want to welcome all of you, all the participants, all the listeners, uh, and especially all the speakers uh, also today for this webinar on climate neutrality and agriculture. And this may be a topic where, where uh, many of you are not thinking first about when it goes to, towards climate and climate neutrality. And that's why we thought it would be important to have talks about that. Uh, but first, some uh, rules or, or to just how this is going to function. Uh, first of all, we will record this session. So there will be an option for you to actually review it later. Uh, we're, we will be as fast as possible to put it on, on our webpage of the European Green Party. Uh, latest on Monday, you will find it there. Um, but uh, participants uh, will not be recorded because you are not going to be seen on video. But your questions uh, will be uh, noted down and also part of the documentation. Um, we will have uh, a session that is very oriented towards um, uh, an exchange with you, uh, dear participants and listeners. So we will spend most of our time uh, to go for your questions and to try to provide answers on the questions that you're interested in. So we will have very short interventions at the beginning. You're very invited to uh, ask your questions in the Q&A section. You can see below the screen, there is this either F and A or Q and A, depends which language you have uh, in your Zoom. Uh, there you can put your questions and I will overlook them and try to uh, include as many as possible into our conversation. So please feel free to just type in the questions you are, uh, uh, you're willing to, to ask. Um, well, on the topic overall, um, I, I would say, well, uh, we're here in the European Union. Uh, my name is Thomas Waits. I forgot to mention that and I'm the co-chair of European Greens and I'm also a member of the European Parliament. And they're very much uh, working on policies like the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy or the biodiversity strategy. A lot of very, let's say, green looking policies uh, that come from the European Union now, but also very much working on the common agriculture policy. And there already we see some kind of, let's say, uh, gaps in between the ambition of a farm to fork or biodiversity strategy or the common agricultural policy. I think we will go deeper into that question. But we also need to look not only into the emissions European agriculture does here on European soil, but we're also uh, a masters of importation of uh, emissions and destruction done other, other ways uh, in, in Indonesia for palm oil and in, in the Amazon for, for soy or beef. Uh, so also this, I think, will be part of our conversation today. But for the actual uh, content inputs, uh, we have very interesting uh, speakers here today. And uh, let me uh, welcome Alex Mason uh, from WWF. Um, EU. He will be the person that will start our, our conversation with the first input. After him, uh, we will welcome Harriet Bradley. She's from BirdLife International. And I hope she will also talk about the, let's say, tensions between the ambition of biodiversity and agriculture. That will be great. Um, then we have Marco Contineo. He's from Greenpeace EU. Uh, I think Greenpeace should be well known. Uh, and there uh, I, we hope to hear something about livestock um, uh, and, and the relations between climate uh, uh, emissions and livestock. Uh, and last but not least, we will have Teresa Anderson from Action Aid International. And they're more on the question how can a just transition look like? So, how do we combine ecological approaches with uh, social or justice approaches. And I'm also very forward looking to hear her. But so we start now with Alex Mason, WWF, on the EU policy framework for climate, agriculture, and LULUCF. And I'm sure a lot of listeners don't know what LULUCF is, but we, you will enlighten us. Uh, and also on the question on bioenergy. We will have short interventions to all the listeners, and we will then ask you to uh, print, type in your questions so we can react on them. So I hand over with no further ado to uh, our, our colleague here, Alex Mason, please. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Thomas, and, and thank you for inviting us to participate. Yeah, just a few brief words on the, the overall policy framework. So uh, at, the, at the highest level, you have this new umbrella law, the EU climate law, which the Parliament and the Council are still currently uh, negotiating. Uh, that, uh, set the target of reaching zero net emissions or, or climate neutrality by 2050. In other words, a, a balance between the remaining emissions uh, 
uh, and removals by carbon sinks like uh, forests. Um, and that law will also include a 2030 target. Um, the council has proposed 55% uh, reduction in emissions compared to 1990. The parliament says 60%, which is closer to, to what the Greens and we are, uh, are calling for, which is 65%. Um, the 55% the council is proposing is not really 55% because they want to include sinks. So they want to uh, include forest offsets in that, which means it would actually only be uh, 50 to 53% reduction in, in emissions. Um, meanwhile, the Commission is preparing updates to all the different climate and energy legislation, so the emissions trading scheme for power plants, for example, the effort sharing regulation, which covers agriculture, buildings, transport, and the Lulu CF regulation, so land use, land use change and forestry, which covers forestry and soil carbon and, and other land use. Um, they're also updating other pieces of legislation, uh, which I can say more about. Um, agriculture emissions are, are split to some extent. You have the, the emissions from uh, livestock and manure management, which is basically methane, and emissions from fertilizer use, that's nitrous oxide. Those are part of the effort sharing regulation, whereas soil carbon emissions from, from cropland, for example, are in the Lulu CF regulation. Um, the commission, we think, is planning to merge uh, the agriculture sector with the Lulu CF regulation. Um, I can say more about that if people are interested and why we think that would be a, a very bad idea. Um, they also want to introduce, we think, uh, trading of credit, so forestry or farms could uh, sequester carbon and then sell those credits to companies like uh, Microsoft, for example, um, which again, we think is a, is a bad idea. Um, and finally, I could say more about bioenergy because the Commission is considering revising its rules on bioenergy, uh, which we think is, is essential because at the moment they're encouraging things which uh, like burning trees and burning crops, which increase emissions compared to fossil fuels. So I'll stop there, but very happy to uh, hear what you'd like to ask questions on and, and, and hope to be able to answer them. Thank you. Thank you for your first statements. Uh, and in fact, already uh, some questions are arising even within me uh, on your last comment, actually, that, uh, that uh, trees, burning trees creates uh, more emissions than uh, even fossils or, or argument crops, maybe. Uh, uh, well, let's, let's have a look into that a bit later. So uh, next, I would ask Harriet. Harriet, would you please uh, uh, give us your input? BirdLife Europe, the floor is yours. Great, yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so the the first aspect that I will touch on is the EU's agricultural subsidies, which is known as its common agricultural policy um, or the CAP. So basically, the EU has a massive amount of agricultural subsidies. Um, it's 32 percent of the EU's budget until 2027. Um, and that equates to almost 400 billion euros. So it's a massive amount of money. It can do a massive amount of harm or a massive amount of good, depending on how it's spent. Um, still at its heart, it's really a policy that's about boosting and subsidizing production. Um, and so therefore has been mainly linked to intensification of agriculture. And this is what's causing all this environmental damage. And in the EU, agriculture is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss and a big contributor to emissions as well. Um, unfortunately, we think the next cap is unlikely to be better. So the one that's being, uh, reform that's being negotiated right now as we speak um, could even be worse because it's giving more flexibility to the member states which normally they use um, for the least environmental purposes. Um, but they haven't finished the negotiations at the EU level, so it's not over yet. Um, but because we are so kind of shocked by what the Council and the Parliament's positions are on this, we're asking the Commission to withdraw its proposal and come with a new one that's more in line with dealing with the climate and the biodiversity crises and helping farmers to transition to more agroecological practices. 
Um, and then on the topic of biodiversity and climate goals and whether they are compatible and complementary um, when it comes to agriculture, um, we would say that it all depends on how you pursue these goals and that they should be pursued together. Um, and pursuing them together means really transforming our agricultural systems. And there was a recent study by Chatham House the last month that's basically saying the same thing as what we're saying that for biodiversity, um, we need to basically make space for nature on all farms. So we need to bring back the hedgerows and the flower strips and the, the ponds, et cetera. Um, we need to have a dietary shift. Um, so we need to shift to mainly plant-based diets in order to free up land for large scale restoration of nature. Um, and also we need to transform the productive practices as well in our agriculture system. So away from pesticides, et cetera. And all of those things are highly compatible and complementary with the climate agenda. Um, so that, that would really be the two kind of working together. I think where there can be trade-offs is where, you know, climate goals might be pursued in isolation or with too heavy a focus on, um, say, technological innovations as opposed to this kind of systemic shift. So, you know, for example, the Irish model, which is about um, increasing their dairy herd and making it more efficient um, per animal, and then they want to offset those emissions with uh, mass afforestation, which is normally happening on really biodiversity valuable habitat. Um, so these are the kind of trade-offs and pathways to kind of climate action we want to avoid. In many cases, they, these aren't the best interventions for the climate either. Um, so I would just end by basically underlining this fact that um, you know, most of the trade-offs between biodiversity and climate um, can be avoided when you really pursue those two goals together. And um, this means like the systemic shift towards more agroecological practices, along with the necessary diet shift that um, has to accompany it. Thank you, Harriet, so much. And, and indeed, it was a very strange situation. I mean, we lost a lot of votes around the CAP uh, Parliament's position. And uh, uh, right after we did the vote, the commissioner, the conservative commissioner, told the parliament, uh, colleagues, uh, please rethink your position because that's not going to work within the Green Deal. And that the commission is actually, uh, I would say, more progressive than the parliament. This was a very new situation uh, indeed. And, and, and for the trade-offs, uh, maybe we can discuss it later, but I see one in, in the, in the uh, dairy, dairy, dairy production. Um, many farmers are replacing soy in the, in, in the fodder. Uh, with silage, like with, um, how do you say, low grass silage, so you cut it very early and very often, and that's uh, obviously um, not a, a good story for biodiversity. Uh, so so I, I fear there are some, some let's say, contradictive um, uh, strategies. But with no delay, uh, we go into the discussion later. Uh, let me hand over to Marco Continero. Please, Marco, Greenpeace. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm going to share, thanks, Thomas. I'm going to share the screen because I wanted to show you a super short presentation just because I'm mentioning numbers and I like uh, those numbers to be uh, clear. I hope you see it. So um, I wanted to mention the, 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 the relevance of the food system globally. Uh, it's basically one third of the emissions that uh, the world is having. Agriculture is 71% of it. The numbers might change is between 25 and 37%. That's, that's the range of the studies we have. If we don't do anything to address agriculture and the food system in general, it will represent by 2050, 52% of emissions. This is based on three studies coming out in very top line uh, um, um, scientific journals. Uh, we decided to try to translate this into something a bit more comprehensible. And it's the fact that if you have a bus with 20 seats, which represents the whole carbon budget that humanity has, and we don't do anything, we're going to get to occupying 11 of these 20 seats just for the food system, excluding deforestation. 
If we, on the, on the contrary, do something and start, for instance, reducing by half the global production and consumption of livestock, so animals, meats, eggs, and, and milk, we're gonna get to occupying only four of these 26, which allows the rest of society, all the other sectors, to actually deal with 16 seats. This can be seen in a, in a, a bit more complex way with, with another graph. The main, and I don't know whether you actually see that because it's here we are, see? Um, the other point is that it depends on the country, but there has to be a global reduction in consumption of meat on the top and dairy on the bottom. But if you can see the, the column in dark gray is the global average. Um, we are not so far, especially when it comes to dairy, but of course in some countries, and here we list China, Brazil, Argentina, the US and Europe, that's where we need to reduce massively the consumption that we are currently having both for meat and for dairy. For more information on this, you can find it in, in the report, Less is More, that we produced two and a half years ago. Now, coming to European emissions. Um, the European Environmental Agency says that agriculture represents 10% of EU emissions. It's still a lot. Out of it, 86, up to 86% is represented by livestock emissions. So livestock does uh, have a, a, an enormous role. Um, scientists, and we also contributed to with, a, with the latest study last year, um, have analyzed a life cycle assessment of livestock, looking at not only the direct emissions that um, Alex talked about before, so enteric fermentation and the management manure, so the, the, the nitrogen coming out of manure, but also indirect land use change, but also energy, the transports, all the emissions that you need to produce the feed necessary to feed our animals. And you get to 12 to 17% of the entire bunch of your emissions. Now, we also looked at the trend, the latest trend in the past 10 years, livestock alone increased the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases by 40 million tons, and which equals to doing the round of the globe by plane 3 million times, just to give you an idea of how big it is. And this also means that the entire emissions coming from the livestock sector, 700 million tons, are actually higher than all the emissions from cars and vans that we currently have in Europe. And then we gave also some other uh, comparisons. What I, where I want to go is concluding by saying that, as the IPCC stressed, the amount, the, the magnitude of the positive um, uh, benefits that we can get out of um, reducing and changing our diets is massive. The IPCC says we can go up to 64% in the reduction of agricultural emissions. And it also stresses that changes in consumption are much higher than the technical measures such as changing feed ratios or um, dealing with manure in a better way or installing some biogas installations. I end by saying, and I think it was very clear from the beginning, if we wanna address climate change, there is nothing more relevant than addressing also the food system, the agricultural system, and clearly the livestock system. Thank you, Marco. That was very clear. And I also appreciate the, the graphics because it makes it so obvious uh, where, where the potential actually lies. Maybe we also come back to the question also on what kind of farming you do. Uh, that may also make a difference, but, but uh, that, that was very, very clear. Thank you so much for that. And uh, then I hand over to Teresa Anderson uh, from ActionAid International. Teresa, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. And thanks also for having me here and to the other speakers. Um, now, as has been made uh, clear from the others, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has made clear that to address both climate change and food security, we need to shift from industrialized crop production to agroecological or organic uh, farming techniques, and we need to shift away from factory farming of livestock to less, but also better, meat. But we also need to recognize that just as we talk about just transition in the energy sector, farming communities also need just transitions to better modes of farming or even alternative economic opportunities. 
Um, and there is a lot of resistance to climate action among farming communities because farming is already a very difficult way of life. Farmers really are constantly squeezed. They're forced often to get big or get out. And so understandably, they can be worried that sort of top down simplistic climate policies are going to add extra burdens to livelihoods that are already quite precarious. And they may feel demonized, they may feel defensive. So as ActionAid, we've developed principles for just transition in agriculture, which I can unpack in more detail later. But briefly, the key takeaway is that it's not only about what you transition to, but how that transition is done. It's about outlining the process as well as the outcome, because it's important to create the space for farming communities to participate and shape in the transformation so that it works for them, as well as for nature and the climate. And that it really addresses the underlying inequalities in the system um, and that communities also get the support they need to make that leap. Um, and if done well, just transition can help communities shift from opposing climate action to being advocates because it creates the space for them to shape a more secure and more just future. Um, so I can talk about that more if you like, but right now I want to flag a second point here about net zero climate targets, which you've heard about. There's been a huge flurry of net zero climate targets from governments, from corporations, but we really need to scrutinize these before we accept them at face value. In particular, we have to watch out for the net part of the net zero climate targets. How big is that net? Um, because unfortunately, instead of really cutting emissions, most of these net zero climate targets really rely very heavily on carbon offsetting. Usually that's with tree plantations or assuming that negative emissions technologies such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage are going to do the bulk of sucking the carbon out of the air after it's been emitted through pollution. But technologies like carbon capture and storage CCS, well, they'll likely never work at scale. Um, but also the bioenergy aspect is going to require massive land grabs in the global south um, to achieve that scaling up. So when it comes to BECS, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, we're basically damned if it does work and damned if it doesn't, because we're facing either massive land grabs and food insecurity or runaway climate change. There is simply not enough land on the planet to meet all the combined corporate and government offsetting targets, which means that we're going to see widespread failure to cut emissions and to achieve these targets and the climate action that we urgently need. And we're going to see vulnerable communities in the global south who've done the least to cause the climate problem and who already face the worst impacts being pushed off their land, just as we saw with the previous biofuel land grab, but probably orders of magnitude bigger. So we really need to scrutinize net zero climate targets before we celebrate them. And if we want to protect land for food security, for ecosystems, we need urgent action in other sectors like energy and industry and for climate targets to be based on real radical urgent transformation. Very clear. Thank you, Teresa. And it makes also clear, don't just uh, look at the label. You really, we really have to look what it's inside, yeah? And whether this is really serving the purpose. And, and also, I mean, you talked about land use. If we want to get rid of fossils in the industrial production, where will the CO2 chains come from, if not from biomass grown material? Yeah. So there's another kind of attempt on land. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this and also with the farmers, I can just sign up to that. Uh, the, the success of organic agriculture in Austria is not based on, on a huge green mindset change of farmers, but simply of farmers realizing that they can make a living uh, if they produce organic and then they are in favor. It's not, the farming community uh, uh, is, is convincible. And I think with 400 billion euros in seven years, we're really missing out a substantive ch chance to actually help the farming community to do the transition. But thank you very much for pointing out on these uh, uh, questions. And, and so I see we have some questions already. Um, and I would say we, we, we go for the second one first. And the, the question is, uh, what risks do, do we see, if any, uh, from soil organic carbon farming slash carbon farming being used as carbon offset? And if I may, I would hand over that question uh, maybe to Alex first. And Teresa, if you want to follow up on it, uh, maybe uh, I, I'll hand over to you too first. But if, uh, if another speaker likes to comment, please uh, indicate to me. So Alex, maybe you go first, please. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, we're certainly 
you know, very much in favor of increasing uh, soil organic carbon and, and carbon sequestration in, in soils and landscapes. Um, so this is absolutely something we need to be, to be encouraging because, you know, although obviously we have to cut emissions very dramatically, we, we also need, in addition, uh, as, as much as we can to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere that, uh, that has already been emitted. Um, it's, the question is really, how do you incentivize that? Uh, what is the governance of that, uh, that activity? And our, our concern is that uh, essentially, if you look at uh, things like carbon dioxide removal in, in the land use sector, this is not simply equivalent to emissions from fossil fuels. Um, carbon dioxide removal is uh, not necessarily as easily measurable um, or predictable. Uh, I mean, the science on this is very clear and, and it's not necessarily permanent um, or irreversible. We, we, we have uh, obviously seen in the past that, um, you know, you can have forest fires or bark beetle outbreaks or all sorts of reversals. And therefore, a sort of market trading system where, you know, one ton of carbon is judged to have been absorbed and therefore, you know, some airline company can just buy that ton of carbon and consider that it's, you know, avoided a ton of CO2 in emissions. That, that, that's a dangerous way we think of doing it. Um, we would prefer to see a system where uh, polluters pay uh, a carbon price for their emissions uh, and that those funds and perhaps common agricultural policy funds are then used directly to incentivize uh, increases in carbon sinks by, by farmers and forests, uh, foresters and others. But yeah, Teresa, maybe you want to add something. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I think as you've touched on, a really important point to get what your head get our heads around is this point about reversals and the difference between emissions from driving my car or flying that are in the air permanently versus um, uh, carbon dioxide that is temporarily absorbed by the soil. Um, so it's it, because because basically soil carbon looks good for the moment, but it can be reversed back into CO2 quite easily, either by plowing, by applying fertilizers or by drought um, or very high temperatures. So it's wrong to assume that my flight now could be neutralized by several acres of soil carbon, because if that soil is plowed again next year, then basically that's the, that I haven't done, I haven't had any overall benefit to the to the climate um, it's like I've done nothing but I've carried on and actually allowed myself to have that flight or that you know be, uh, believing that it's all been neutralized so so that's one of the problems with offsets um, and another factor though is that uh, possibly the corporation that I think I can safely say in this in this uh, audience there's um, a high number of people would be skeptical about um, the role of Monsanto, Bayer and GM crops um, because Monsanto, Bayer are actually the probably the biggest proponents of soil carbon offsets because they claim that they by spraying um, Roundup herbicide on, on their GM Roundup ready crops, uh, they are avoiding tillage and therefore that counts as sequestered soil carbon. And so soil carbon offsets, uh, and it's already sort of starting to roll out tentatively in, in the US, California especially, that ends up as a subsidy for GM crops. And it's something we really don't want to see happening anymore. Um, and there's also a risk that if, if this rolls out in a large way in other parts of the world, it could end up driving land grabs, etc. So, and we've seen when it comes to the, the monitoring reporting verica verification that Alex alluded to, that it's not the farmers that end up getting the money, it's the, it's the carbon consultants. And, and the, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, crazy dynamics around carbon offsets anyway, which, uh, which we probably don't have time to go into. But I think it's right, we need to find other ways to incentivize agroecology, but do dubious carbon counting isn't it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for actually pointing out on, on, on that question. It may be a bit different uh, in forests uh, um, where, where we, we may see uh, chances to, to uh, sequest carbon in a more uh, long-term manner. I don't know. I mean, this is also linked to the, all the Lulu CF question. Uh, and, and I have a question here uh, that is, maybe I, I pointed to Marco first. Um, 
uh, what is Lulu CF and how does it relate to agriculture? Yeah, and how does it relate? Uh, or what potential does it have as a natural sink or as a carbon sequest sequestration mechanism? Uh, is, is this something you, you you have worked on, Marco? Uh, I think Alex is the definitely the expert there. Uh, what I can say very briefly is that we, uh, um, how can I say, the risk as it has already been said is to use the LULUCF, so land use and land use change sector as an excuse for other sectors not to do what is essential uh, to do. We need first and foremost to reduce emissions. That has to be the number one, two, three, five, six, ten, fifteen. That's where all the energy has to be uh, addressed. Uh, then, of course, we need to, one, one thing that we uh, that, that many people don't know is that carbon sinks exist. They have been uh, reaching quite good levels a few years ago, but it's already been almost a decade since the carbon sinks we had in Europe went from, I think in the 90s, we had 180 million tons. We went up to 350, a bit more. We are now down again to almost the 1990s level. And this is very, very worrying. Why is that? Because we are mistreating our soils, is because we are badly managing our forests. We've been calculating that currently, the, the, the basically the, the, the logging, we log 77% of, of what forests, productive forests provide us with. If we went down to 50% of the logging rate, which is not enormous. Of course, the logging industries in Finland and Sweden and other countries are horrified by the idea. But if we reduce the logging rate, we would be able to basically increase by twice as much the carbon sinks we have in Europe. Not, not speaking about good, well done restoration, which is what we actually need to do. So even by, by looking at the LULUCF, and then I'll leave it to Alex, uh, there are huge potentials if we stop looking at the vested interest of few companies and looking at the interest of society as a whole. Yeah, but the agriculture community here in the parliament, they are in love with paying farmers for carbon sequestering, so-called. Yeah? Uh, but maybe, yes, Alex, and maybe, Alex, you can also uh, give us a word on reforestation or afforestation, whether this is part of the solution in your regard. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Marco has said uh, most of what I would say on, on LULUCF. Um, I mean, the, the LULUCF sector at the moment there includes emissions from soils, and that's mostly from peatland uh, soils, which have been drained. So that's the, you know, it's a very small area overall. I think, you know, something like 3% of, no, it's 1.5% of cropland is organic soils. Um, but that's, you know, over half of all the soil carbon emissions. Um, and there are similar figures for, for grazing land on, on peatland soil. So, you know, that's an obvious target. Um, and, but, but mostly in the LULUCF sector, you have this very significant carbon sink from forests. And that's because, you know, we spent hundreds of years, well, thousands of years, um, cutting down forests and uh, burning them for fuel. Um, or using them to build ships, in the case of my, my home country, to... Um, uh, so, you know, we do have a forest carbon sink, um, which is substantial. As Marco says, it has been declining and is predicted to decline further up to 2030, um, partly because of uh, increased harvesting that member states plan, uh, including for bioenergy. And this is something that we need to reverse. I mean, the, somebody asked in the in the questions about why we think this uh, AFOLU idea is, is a bad one. So putting putting the agriculture emissions from livestock and fertilizer use into the land use sector to create this agriculture, forestry and other land use or an AFOLU sector. Uh, I think, you know, the, the thing we see there is, as, as Marco says, it, it just risks using the, the forest carbon sink to mask emissions in the agriculture sector um, and therefore reduce the incentives to cut emissions fast in the agriculture sector. Um, I mean, the transport sector, I'm sure, and the industry sector would love to be able to, you know, put themselves together with the forest carbon sink. Um, it's not clear why, 
uh, livestock and fertilizer emissions in the in the farm sector should be given this uh, existing sink, which would offset a very large part of their their emissions. Um, uh, on on reforestation uh, and afforestation, I mean. I think Greenpeace has published this report. I think this is the one that you were referring to, Marco, about you know what you could do with existing forests um, by reducing harvesting intensity. Um, you know, obviously there is potential for reforestation or, or afforestation if it's done in a in a biodiverse way, so that you have a, a natural, resilient biodiverse forest rather than. Uh, you know, a, a monoculture plantation of uh, non-native species, which will uh, not produce, uh, not store as much carbon and not be as, as resilient to climate change. So that, that, that has a role, but there is this huge potential from uh, restoring existing forests because, you know, small trees take a long time to, to, to grow and bigger trees absorb a lot more carbon every year. So, you know, the, the, the quicker win, I think, is, is restoring existing forests. And, and I would just maybe make one point that, you know, if you, if you listen to the forest industry and the Finns and the Swedes, you know, they will say, we need to increase harvesting um, on climate grounds in order to produce more wood for buildings. And unfortunately, the European Commission seems to have bought into this logic, but I mean, from, from our understanding of the science, there is no good evidence that harvesting trees for timber, even if it replaces concrete and steel, delivers any significant climate benefit. So we think there's a, there's a real risk here that we again shoot ourselves in the foot by, by doing something that has unintended consequences. Well, for sure not the uh, Finnish spruce monoculture plantations, which I don't call a forest, actually. It's, a, it's a, a, yeah, well, um, plantations. Um, well, uh, we, we've, heard, we've heard different perspectives on what potentials or not so much potential, different measurements on, on agricultural land or on forest on, uh, in terms of sequestration could have actually the conclusion, the overall conclusion, if, if, if I may to put it here, uh, it's, it is, is that we need to reduce emissions first. And there may be some fields of action where we can also uh, sequest carbon, but this can only be in the second or third row, uh, a little contribution to the solution. But you, we've heard, you've heard now, Harry, you've heard different proposals uh, or, or points of views on, on how to sequest carbon. Uh, how does that fit into the question of biodiversity loss? Um, uh, also the forestry question. Um, uh, can you can you give us a feedback on that? Uh, we, we, the question actually read, what kind of trade-offs are there between reducing emissions in agriculture, and I include forestry, and biodiversity loss? Can you name some concrete examples? Um, yeah, so I, I was, I'll start maybe with the forestry question, and what kind of forests we're talking about. So, um, you know, from a biodiversity perspective, of course, you know, restoring forests and um, mainly this can be actually done through just leaving forests to regrow themselves. It's actually the best way to restore forests. Um, but in the past, the way that this has been done in Europe, we've had really bad um, experience with really valuable biodiversity habitat being planted up with these um, really harmful, you know, monoculture forests. So lots of um, high nature value grasslands being destroyed and um, peatlands as well, which in many places is actually also a climate disaster as well. So I think we need to obviously be really careful about, yeah, what kind of forest you're talking about. And I think the others have mentioned that these kind of commercial forestry plantations are not what we need for biodiversity or a climate perspective. Um, and we definitely shouldn't be planting them on really valuable habitats like you know high nature value grasslands um, just to make a point which is that actually in Europe interestingly um, grasslands are some of the most biodiversity rich habitats that we have and Europe is um, quite uh, unique in that sense because in most of the world most of the biodiversity is actually in forests um, but in Europe we get actually most of our biodiversity in grasslands um, so, um, but these are obviously grasslands that are managed, you know, primarily for biodiversity. So 
Um, there's also an issue with how most grasslands or many grasslands are managed today in Europe and the intensification of grassland management. And if you have a very intensive grassland that if in effect is kind of being managed as just a crop, um, then you're not really providing any benefits for biodiversity. So, um, so yeah, we definitely need to avoid, you know, these trade-offs between destroying habitats like high nature value grasslands. We actually need to restore those kind of habitats um, and, you know, alongside things like, like forests. Um, just one more note, I think, on the grasslands, which is that, um, of course, grasslands, I think when people talk about which agricultural emissions we should kind of accept because they have other benefits, people often point to grasslands. Um, and I think there the point to make is that a um, very rich, biodiversity rich, extensively managed grassland is storing carbon. And as soon as you plow that grassland, you're gonna release all the carbon. So we should be protecting those carbon stocks. Obviously, if you have some animals on that grassland, then they're going to be um, causing some emissions. But from the biodiversity perspective, the biodiversity benefits happen at very, very low numbers of animals. So the more animals you have basically on that land, the less biodiversity. So in a sense, you know, you may have some emissions, but if you want to have like a um, grassland that's managed in the best way for biodiversity, you're going to have very few animals on there anyway. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I'll maybe leave it there. Um, there might be other trade offs that um, we can explore um, in the rest of the webinar. In a way, we're we're back at the livestock question because with that over overly uh, amounts of of livestock, we have a, a huge amounts of manure across Europe, and where are they spread? I mean, on every little piece of land that you can find. Uh, and, and, but uh, thank you for, for that. I mean, that also means that uh, protecting also the alpine ridges and, and that kind of extensive grazing areas makes sense for climate and biodiversity, uh, both at the same time. Um, that, that's quite, quite interesting. Um, um, well, uh, maybe I, I, I move on on, 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 a, on another question when it comes to to, to biomass um, uh, and, and, and bioenergy and biofuels. And if I may, I, I point that question to Teresa. Um, Teresa, I'm, I mean, uh, it is sold as, as one of the big concepts uh, to tackle climate change that we change towards biofuels, towards biomass uh, in, in construction. Uh, and also if we look at the numbers of emissions uh, that agriculture and forestry create, we, 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 we tend to overlook that we're importing a lot of emissions from other regions of the world uh, by agricultural products, but even wood chops, meanwhile, for, for pellets heating and so on. Um, uh, can, you, can you share your experiences on, on what, what that, these kind of political decisions that we had in the past on, uh, on certain quotas, on, on biofuel, in the diesel and so on, what effects does that have on the rest of the world uh, that Europeans tend to not look too close at? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'll I'll talk about the biofuel lessons uh, from the from the bio the liquid biofuel push that has happened in the EU over the first last year, and then maybe I'll also respond to the question about BECs in general. Um, we learned a lot during the 2007 2008 um, push for bioenergy biofuels to be a solution to the climate crisis because of course on one level it makes sense that we replace uh, harmful fossil fuels with something natural um, and so the, the idea that something natural and green would automatically be good for the climate is is quite an obvious assumption to make but what we quickly saw was that um, was that of course that needs land and that needs farmland to grow it on and it's going to be the communities that have the least uh, legal protection the most insecure um, land tenure um, often women on marginal lands called idle marginal unused land they're, they're not recognized in their indigenous communities they're the ones that that will always be displaced and have always been displaced by um, by the massive land grab for biofuels so I was working um, with uh, an African network um, in 2007 and I remember one year sitting in a meeting and something like eight countries all said in my local area we've had land grabs for biofuels what's going on 
one. And we realized that this was a massive rush going on. And so ever since then, we've been fighting um, the implications of this because we saw it was leading to massive deforestation, illogically, obviously, but not only that, it was leading to um, the, the displacement of smallholder farmers, indigenous peoples, and rising food prices. So if we want to have food, <laughs> it's food security, and uh, it's not compatible with biofuels on a large scale. Now, um, the question about BECs, the suggestion of small scale BECs, is that possible? Well, the point about BECs, it's bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And the carbon capture and storage technology is not viable and may never will be as massively, massively expensive. And it actually requires a lot of energy. You know, it's basically not adding up the amount of energy you need to squeeze the carbon into a format that can stay permanently underground requires more energy <laughs> to, to make it viable. And so they haven't managed to crack that. May, they may never will. Um, but uh, if they get it, if they do manage to get it going, they're not going to just say, let's keep it small scale. They're going to say, let's maximize the potential to do that and use masses of bioenergy to, um, to basically play the role of sucking carbon out the air, in theory, to stick underground. That's the idea of matching the bioenergy piece with the CCS. Um, but the most harmful thing about BEX is not even that the technology itself has the risk to land grab and food security, as bad as that is. It's the idea that BEX is going to solve the climate problem. But, but BEX may never happen. And But if you look at many national climate models, um, scientific models, even earlier iterations of the IPCC um, assessment reports, they all had massive assumptions that, well, we don't really need to do transformation. We don't really need to cut emissions because BEX, BEX will solve the problem. And so BEX is basically being used as a proxy for climate inaction. And whatever you don't can't be bothered to do, just color it in, in your graph with BEX. That's basically the solution. But if you calculate how much land that BEX would amount to, some models say that um, some assumptions or calculations think that we could use require almost the same amount of land that the land uh, that the planet currently uses to grow crops which is 1.5 billion hectares some models suggest that we would need that much if we were using bex to suck carbon out the air of course we don't have an extra 1.5 billion uh, hectares on the planet so that's why we're very very worried about the implications on land and food security yeah, it's rather the opposite. We're losing thousands and tens of thousands of hectares every year to actually uh, wrong, wrong agricultural practices, erosion, saltification, and so on, and also to climate change that is uh, climate warming that is happening already. So it's it's less and less land actually that we can work on. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you want to add up to that uh, to that answer? Um, maybe uh, you. I also have a question that goes towards the question on methane and manure management and and uh, whether what, what potential potential that has or that what potential you would see uh, in, in, in changing these practices and doing this kind of bioenergy fermentation, uh, which then leads to, to, to longer um, um, uh, fertilizer chains and so on. But, but is, is that, in your view, part of, of the solution or, again, actually, a, 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 let's say, a, a try to cover up uh, the, the emissions of the production or please? Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, just to start uh, by saying I completely agree with Teresa and, and everything that she said. I think, you know, we're, we're also, as WWF, skeptical of, uh, of BEX and have a lot of concerns about it, which is why we think it's not something that should be pursued. Certainly at, at present, the, the overwhelming emphasis needs to be on cutting emissions. And uh, when we're looking at carbon dioxide removal, we should be restoring ecosystems, so you know, nature-based solutions rather than speculative um, technological uh, options. Particularly given the, the the potential social and environmental impacts that they could have. Um, maybe just to say something more generally on on bioenergy. Um, I guess the first thing is 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 this question of scale. Um, so at the moment we are with fossil fuels, we are burning millions of years of buried sunshine, essentially, uh, hundreds of millions of years. Um, and th the idea that 
any significant part of that can be replaced with the biomass that grows on the planet in, in one year is, is simply fanciful, frankly. Um, I mean, there are various different numbers, but if you look at the World Resources Institute, uh, you know, they estimated that if you, if you took all of the biomass in the world um, that we harvest, so all of the crops, all of the wood, all of the fiber, um, all of the grass grazed by our livestock, if you took all of that and you used it all for energy, you might supply 20% of global energy demand in 2050. And, and by the way, that would mean you have no food, no clothes, no timber, no light, nothing else. So, I mean, that, that gives, you know, that may not be exactly the right figure, but it gives you a sense of, of the realistic potential for bioenergy to displace fossil fuels. Um, so we, you know, we shouldn't get carried away with it. The, the other thing, the important point I think about bioenergy, apart from the, the, the social uh, and international impact, is, is the climate impact of bioenergy. And, you know, at WWF, we're, we're absolutely not opposed to bioenergy. There are types of bioenergy that, that clearly make a lot of sense. So, uh, Thomas, you mentioned, you know, anaerobic digestion of, of uh, slurry or manure, you know, or food waste, for example, things that, you know, would otherwise produce methane, which we know is a potent greenhouse gas. So, you know, those sort of things at, at a local level um, are, are a very good example on the whole of, of bioenergy used to produce biogas. But it's, you know, it's small scale um, and it will primarily be used locally. It's, it's not something that's going to mean we decarbonize the whole gas grid, you know. Um, but, but the problem is that there are lots of types of bioenergy that actually increase emissions compared to fossil fuels. I mean, you know, we've seen with biofuels like, you know, palm oil, for example, uh, palm oil, biodiesel, when you take into account the impacts on deforestation in, for example, Indonesia and so on, you know, if you look at the full life cycle, you can end up with fuels that are maybe three times uh, the emissions of fossil diesel, you know, which is clearly completely mad, right? I mean, that's just a, uh, that's obviously a cure much worse than the disease. Um, and even where there's not this, uh, what they call indirect land use change, so deforestation happening somewhere else, even if you're just looking at the European Union, right, the, the commission wants to, to have dedicated crops on 10% of agricultural land, abandoned or marginal land, uh, to produce energy crops, um, which obviously the farm industry thinks is a great idea, you know, more money for farmers to grow energy. If you do nothing with that land, just, just leave it completely alone, then what happens is, you know, vegetation returns, um, ultimately ending up in, in forestry um, or, or forests. And what you see, if you look at the, the, the data, is that that will sequester more carbon then you, then you displace through growing energy crops. So again, any dedicated use of land for, for energy crops, whether it's you know, ethanol or bio energy, energy crops, it, it's just counterproductive in climate terms, let alone the biodiversity implications. No. Um, sure. And if I may, it doesn't make sorry. sense to plow a field uh, and then plant with artificial fertilizer and pesticides, corn on it, and then pour it into a biogas plant and you think you do something ecologically nice, uh, you even waste the heat and you uh, put some bits and pieces of electricity into the grid and sell it as eco, ecological uh, electricity. Yeah, but that's, that's part of the, the, the European story. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is, and unfortunately, the, the Renewable Energy Directive you know, still encourages all of these things. There's, there's, there is a cap on food and feed-based biofuels, but that's still allows for certain you know, expansion. There's still quite a lot of harmful stuff. I mean, I would also just say on the, on the forest biomass side, I mean, as you say, there's, there's a big growth in emissions from burning wood, essentially, that's been happening in recent years. And you know, a growth in imports of wood pellets from Russia, from the US, from Canada, Brazil, but also increased production in, in Estonia and Latvia and Slovakia, you know, and again, the, the key with bioenergy, when it comes to climate anyway, it's, it's what you're burning, not 
how how it was produced yeah. and you know so burning sawdust from from a sawmill has very different climate impacts to burning you know large trees and again burning trees for example will tend to increase emissions for decades potentially even centuries I think Marco also wanted to comment on it, and then I would like to move on to the consumption question, actually. Um, uh, yeah, um, okay, so two very super quick things on, 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 on methane, um, which are linked to the consumption one. Uh, first of all, I quoted exactly for this purpose the IPCC when they said that the reduction in consumption have significantly higher impacts than technical measures, because that's, that's what we're facing. The, um, the magnitude, that we, we have in front of us and, and which should be the focus of our intellectual uh, you know, agreements or disagreements is that, uh, yes, you can build biogas installations, but in order to do that, you need to take into consideration the costs. Currently to have a biogas installation, you need to have a, a, a farm that holds at least 300 cows, dairy cows. So a 300 cows farm, especially in, in many countries, it's not a small farm, it's not a medium farm, it, stands, it starts being a bigger farm. And that bigger farm has issues because when you have animals in the same place, you have less lands where they can eat grass and graze, so you use more concentrated feed. Where does it come the concentrated feed? From the Americas, Latin America or North America. Um, how is it uh, produced by using fertilizers, uh, GM crops, uh, monocultures? So you're using a land in a very, uh, um, in a in a, in a very inefficient way, non-efficient way. Um, not only then you can change the um, uh, the, 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 the 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 GM uh, uh, structure of cows, for example. This is one of the fields where there are studies and and, and investigations. Um, you can reduce the enteric fermentation of cows for the time being, the benefits are between four and 12%. But the cows that come out of it don't produce enough milk to be viable from an economic point of view. So instead of focusing on end of pipe solutions, why don't we look at the 64% potential reduction by adopting diets, not by becoming vegetarian or vegan, but by adopting diets which are beneficial for ourselves as consumers in the first place, shouldn't we, ad shouldn't we check first where the massive benefit and potentials are instead of focusing in, on very tiny small potential if in the future technology will allow us to get? Yeah. Sorry, I guess. Uh, no, not, not very, very clear, very clear. Um, uh, Okay, but, but then, I mean, you, you said, well, uh, genetical modification of cows, and that, there we actually, I can br bring in a question that we've also seen uh, on, on, and I would like to hand it to Teresa, because Teresa, you talked about uh, uh, GMOs and, and uh, the kind of industry interest and how they frame it in a green way and uh, get uh, added subsidies and so on. But the question is more or less, do you see any potential for uh, gene editing technologies, CRISPR-Cas or stuff like that, uh, um, or is your, own, your main concern like the power grab of some multinational companies which is of concern for sure but uh, do, you, do you see a potential in that well i think the the starting point for a question about the potential of gm is to say do we really need gm is it the only option we have or are there other alternatives because i think i see so much gm technology is rather a solution in search of a problem um, whereas actually there are usually better, or in fact, always better alternatives out there. When we talk about the need to develop um, drought resistant or pest resistant or nutritional crops, there are always natural alternatives that have been developed by smallholder farmers, indigenous farmers around the world for, for centuries or millennia. And these are, the, these are the crops that are exactly being pushed out by industrialized farming systems, which, um, I mean, GM crops can require millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of, of dollars to produce. So if you are a GM company, of course you want to recoup your investment through your patented um, technology by, by using strategies that force as many farmers as possible to use your crop and only your crops, which is why we've seen in, the, in North America that you know 98% of the canola um, market is GMOs because 
it's because you know the the cross pollination and all the all the legal uh, rules around it make it almost impossible for farmers to grow any alternative. So um, we see. So the, the question that's been in here about well maybe maybe rather than being um, corporate controlled, which which does have its issues, maybe maybe we should be talking about um, public service GM crops like CRISPR Cas. But the thing is, we always see that these public um, public GM uh, uh, products are really a bit of a Trojan horse. They're designed to open the door to to legitimize the idea in the public, or basically to not to make it impossible to say to say no to any private sector um, involvement afterwards. Because once you've got the public sector products, it's very hard to to stop the the Monsanto bears, etc coming in afterwards. So, um, and then that of course tips the balance to, to the exploitative systems that we see. So I really don't see that we need such an expensive um, and, and a risky technology that, you know, that has the, that you know, we don't know what will happen in terms of um, local pollution, et cetera, um, uh, contamination and better just to, to use the biodiversity, the biodiversity that we have. To all the listeners, I, I, I was touring many years ago, I was touring with Percy and Louise Schmeiser from Canada, where, because you mentioned uh, Concola and like the, the eradication of all varieties and potential varieties of, of Concola because of cross-pollination, which led to claims of the companies uh, on actually their seeds, on Percy Schmeiser's seeds, because there were some cross-pollinated GM uh, genes in there, in, in, in introduced in, into their uh, species, actually. Uh, yeah, Marco, you raised your hand, but I, I, I give you a short comment, and then I would like to hand over to Harriet on that. Okay, one minute um, on 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 the solutions. So on CRISPR car or on on, on 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 all GM technologies, genetic engineering or genome editing are uh, um, uh, touching upon the, the 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 genes of living organisms. The question uh, is that there are some features that are easy uh, easy to engineer. For example, the resistance to specific herbicides or the creation of a specific uh, protein. That, that, that repels uh, uh, the pest. The problem on uh, with, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, drought resistant crops is that there is, for, for, for the vast majority of crops, the resistance to drought is being uh, modeled by the interaction of 10 to 30 different pairs of genes. And we don't have yet the capacity from a scientific point of view to understand how to touch all those pairs of genes and their interactions. But that's just the first problem. The second problem is that if you want a drought tolerant plant, well, that plant is not gonna solve your problems because the problems we are facing are erratic weather conditions. And if you want that, we don't have one single plant that can react and be resilient because we don't have resilient GM, whether old or new plants. We have resilient systems. If the soil is rich in carbon, if you have been treating the soil in a certain way and provide diversity, then that system will be able to resist to a specific shock, whether it's a drought, where it's early cold, where it's too much rain, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the, the very beginning of finding the solution that decides whether the solution works or not. Exactly. So. It's about the soils at the end of the day. Uh, you can see that whenever it's getting dry, look at your organic farmer's field and the neighbor field of the conventional one, and you will see how solutions look like. But I would like to hand over to, to Harriet here. I mean, when we talk about uh, GMOs and like all kinds of ideas, how GMOs could help for, for tackling climate crisis, uh, that rings the alarm bells of everyone talking about uh, biodiversity, doesn't it? Um, yeah, honestly, um, in our work in bird life, we've been focusing mainly on the intensive farming system and like the, the model itself and like the problems that that brings. Um, so this is where we're basically calling for this kind of transformation to a more agroecological model that's more of a wholesale um, transformation. And that's really what we've been focusing on in our advocacy rather than kind of looking at a specific technology or, or other. Yeah, 
Sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, there was a very concrete question also, I would say, towards your direction. And the question reads, I've seen biodiversity credits in New South Wales being used to offset, in question marks, the impact of development on biodiversity. Uh, is that just another form of greenwashing? Wor uh, worse, uh, it, that it gives destruction a pass or something of use for maintaining biodiversity? How, how do you, what's your, what's your quote on, on that uh, yeah, um, I would say, it's, I mean, it's a good question. I would say that the general principle of which to like answer all these things is what are you replacing? So what are you destroying? And what are you putting in its place? So if you're destroying a really kind of well-established or even untouched natural habitat and you're replacing it with something that you've kind of created. So let's say, for example, you destroy um, a high nature value grassland um, and you convert that into arable and then you recreate maybe you you restore a grassland somewhere else of course that comparison is going to depend completely on you know the management also of the new grassland but just to say that generally if you destroy a kind of untouched habitat that kind of biodiversity is really hard to ever get back like if you destroy a grassland that's never ever been plowed then you are destroying a lot of that kind of seed bank basically irreparably. So I think when, when there's anything to do with kind of offsetting and them saying, yeah, we'll build, you know, this the UK, they've got this high speed rail network and we'll just make, make some parks elsewhere. Um, I think it is, you really have to look at the fact that they're talking about destroying ancient woodlands, which have got so much like biodiversity built up and are storing so much carbon. And if you just, plant another woodland somewhere else, it's not going to have the same biodiversity and climate benefit. Um, but of course, it depends. Again, you could be destroying something that was, you know, not that valuable and creating something more valuable. So you have to sort of look at the, the case in the hand, in hand. Very clear. Very clear. Well, then moving towards consumption, I, I stick with you for a second, Harriet. Uh, uh, I mean, a direct question that one of one, a question coming from my side. Uh, let's imagine we would have 100% organic agriculture across Europe. Would that solve the biodiversity uh, crisis? Um, I think that yes, in a large part. So we completely advocate like for organic agriculture. Um, but I think that in you know this organic agriculture as it is kind of currently certified in the legal requirements, don't actually have that many biodiversity specific requirements. They're really about um, not using pesticides and like fertilizers. So um, basically what we really need for biodiversity is organic plus like more space for nature in the landscape. And those two things basically can work together. Um, so I think that we need to, we need to basically have a kind of um, organic agriculture and the productive part, let's say, but we also for biodiversity need to have non-productive elements of the farm because if you think of like the way that animals behave in order to say breed and we've got like lots of ground nesting bird species for example in Europe they want somewhere that's sheltered um, where they can hide from predators and if you are just um, not having any of that kind of natural vegetation that's not being disturbed um, on your farm then those species aren't really going to have the, the space to do that. Um, so we definitely need both. Um, and I think we've got some really good um, scientific studies that are showing that, you know, where you have organic agriculture plus the space for nature, then you get the best biodiversity outcomes. Mm. Um, and just a final thing that I think that still comes back to the question of consumption, um, because I think all the studies that have, there have been studies looking into how we can um, switch to organic agriculture in the EU and also globally. And they all confirm that if you want to do that, then the yields of organic agriculture are lower. Maybe in the long run, you know, you're going to be able to produce for a longer time, but the yields in the immediate um, uh, in the immediate term are lower. And so for that, we need to actually like be able to free up land. And the way that we do that is to lower like the consumption of meat and dairy and kind of rebalance um, a bit the, the landscape and have more mixed farming systems. Thank you.
Right. Uh, that maybe let's stick to the question of on, on consumption. I mean, one of the arguments uh, on organic is very often, well, this is for the for the ones that are well off, that are that are wealthy enough to to afford it. Uh, even though, I mean, there's also like direct delivery systems and so on, or if you go uh, seasonal, and so it does it, it doesn't mean that it has to be so much more expensive. Uh, but also on the consumption, there was one very clear question on uh, what kind of policies can we imagine or how can the EU actually influence the consumption of citizens? And I, I, it's a very cheeky question. I just recall that several years ago, German Greens really had the backlash uh, in voters uh, 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 because of asking for a so-called veggie day. Yeah? So it's a very sensitive issue. Citizens are not very happy if, you, uh, if they have the impression you want to tell them what they shall eat and what not. But what kind of policies would be possible there? And maybe, uh, uh, okay, uh, then I go for Marco first and maybe then I ask Teresa also for a comment, if you wish. Yeah, Marco, please. No, no, Teresa, if you want to go. Uh, it's okay, Marco, you, you, okay. you go, it's okay. Well, first of all, time changes. Uh, and yes, things in the past five years have changed quite radically, and I'm very happy because of that. Um, there are really an awful lot of things that we can do in terms of policy measures. The first one, I think, is for the EU, but also national level, to set to accept that by address, addressing consumption and therefore also production, we can uh, um, get a lot of benefits. Uh, so having an EU uh, initiative that sets targets by 2030, 2050, et cetera, on the reduction of need and the reproduction and consumption would be essential. But then there are many others. For example, uh, uh, public procurement, having uh, improving uh, uh, green public procurement at EU and at national level can also, by addressing uh, canteens of public buildings, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, armies, schools, universities is something that uh, is very important. Um, making sure that the school schemes become much more skewed in favor of fruit and vegetables rather than milk, for example, is another way. Stop Stopping using public money to promote the consumption of meat and dairy, for instance, would be a very easy first step. We are using, I think, 36% of the 200 millions that we use every year for, to promote uh, our products are used directly for the promotion of meat and dairy. And if we, if we add also the other, uh, the rest of the money, we get to 57% of this annual uh, pot of money that is being used to promote meat and dairy. And we believe that it's simply unacceptable to do so. Uh, but then there are many others. I mean, we can uh, we can clearly uh, uh, we should clearly stop uh, uh, promoting subsidies via the common agricultural policy, for instance, to go to factory farms directly, but also indirectly to all the cereal producers. Uh, we should start promoting and giving money and rewarding farmers that uh, uh, grow livestock extensively and that reduce their own numbers. There was a question about how do we convince a pig uh, producer in Denmark. That's a very, very important question. We need to set in motion a transition. And that transition, that's why the CAP exists. It uses public money to do what it's good for society. If we identify that we need to go to a reduction in the numbers of animals that we are producing, then let's use public money to help those farmers to reach that goal. We, we clearly cannot pretend that they should you know, give up their farms from one day to the other. But that's why we use 60 billion euros a year of cap money. The, the resistance of the sector was enormous. We tried to put uh, a limit of 160, uh, 170 kilo uh, uh, nitrogen per hectare. We, we tried to put limits on amounts of animals per hectare. Uh, so to, to be eligible for subsidies, we, we, I mean, we, we failed. I openly say we failed. Yeah? Uh, Teresa, please. Yeah, I think this brings us back to the point I, I was making earlier about um, how just transition processes could hopefully um, bring those different stakeholders, those different community members who currently resist and are quite worried about the implication of a shift to say, well, what do you need? What would be helpful to make you uh, support you to make that leap? So whether it's subsidizing the right kind of agriculture rather than currently subsidizing the wrong kind of agriculture that we see, 
um, you know, the kind of infrastructure investments that are that are in there, you know, because we see government support all sorts of infrastructure for big dairy, big, big meat, big big ag, but they support very little. I mean, all of the smallholder local markets, um, diversified crop production, organic, they're, they're doing it for the love and for the fun and for the enjoyment, but with very little um, infrastructure support. And it would make all the sense to actually turn that around and, and instead of supporting the wrong kind of agriculture and, and, and local diversified systems, um, uh, support the right kind of thing. Um, and, and, but just to make sure that um, farmers really can, and, uh, and the communities that are part of the lo local broader food system um, have, have the chance to articulate what their concerns are and what they need to make that shift. Um, I think the question about consumption though and changing consumption patterns is really interesting. Now, I mean, on the whole, I'm, I'm, in, big, I'm in favor of, of what the role that regulation and policy and public finance can do, but I can also really see that there have been big behavior shifts um, and trends happening in relation to meat, in relation to organics, et cetera, over these last years. And, and that um, there are interventions that can be made to shift public perception. And actually by shifting public perception, you create the, the enabling environment for policies to shift. Um, so I think things like um, shaping trends, um, you know, where things are placed in supermarkets is actually an, an interesting way to start shaping behavior. Um, food education, cooking, advertising, these are all things that it would be worth making significant investment in, in order to A, create the change, B, create the, the conditions for policy change. As we've heard, we're still investing hundreds of millions into advertisement for meat and diary. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so, okay. But I, I've seen Harriet, uh, you wanted to comment on it as well. So, uh, if you like, the floor is yours. You were writing in the chat. No? Oh, I was sorry. I was responding to a different question. <laughs> okay. You still want yeah. to? Go ahead. Oh, well, there was just one on silvo pasture um and whether this is a good thing um and yeah i mean i honestly i'm not a silver pasta expert but yes i would say that in general these kind of practices are um the kind of ones that are uh, good for climate and biodiversity um of course we still need to consider you know produce being able to produce food as well so i think the general thing is that there are amazing experiments going on with things like rewilding and um like really extensive um, grassland management, but that's probably not going to be, you know, the widespread solution in terms of being able to produce enough food. Um, so they serve a massive biodiversity um, value, but because they take up so much land, that's not the way that we are going to um, to feed the world, which is still obviously um, an important concern. And yeah, just brings us back again to the need to kind of free up land that's currently being used for the more intensive. Um, meat and dairy systems and also um uh, also bioenergy production and um, these other issues yeah. yeah very clear i see also one of our listeners has pointed out that also organic agriculture is getting more and more intensive like four to five cuts in grassland per year uh yeah but we, we've heard earlier um, organic agriculture it may be part of the solution but can't be the overall solution we still need to give nature space uh, on, on top of it uh, because yeah it's true uh, that organic agriculture is also increasing uh, increasingly going intensive but i mean even if with with uh, systems of crop rotation uh, you you always you, you already have a higher resilience of your farm income actually because different plants are, uh, are getting ripe at different times of the year and if you are building on more pillars uh, you even stay with an income in difficult years so that's also maybe one of the uh, potentials of, of, of uh, agroecology or, or uh, um, bio, biological agriculture. Yes, Alex, please. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to, to add a point uh, on this question of meat, meat consumption. I mean, if, if we look at the climate modeling that's done uh, of how the EU or the world generally will get to uh, zero emissions um, or zero net emissions and then later go into net negative emissions, you, you simply can't do it without a major change in diets. Um, you, you know, there's, there's no model that will, will do it. And that's partly because of the emissions from 
the livestock uh, themselves, um, but also uh, obviously the, the area of land that's used to produce feed, um, because I mean, I forget the figure, but it's something like, like a half or two thirds of EU agricultural land is directly or indirectly um, devoted to livestock farming. So, so there's, there's that question, but also because you, you have to free up a very large amount of land uh, for restoration of forests and other carbon rich uh, natural ecosystems. Because, and, and, and somebody asked a question about the scale of what we need to do. I mean, if you're going to, to get to climate neutrality, you know, you basically need to cut emissions by at least 90%, probably 95% um, by 2050, or, you know, as we say, by 20, 2040. Um, and, and, you know, th that's the sort of level of emissions reduction you need because the potential for carbon dioxide removal is not great and uh, will only be possible, you know, significantly possible if we can if we can change diets and, and I would just say on that I mean it, it is obviously politically incredibly difficult it's not something that I work on but um, uh, the, there is a lot of benefit we think in um, the sort of citizens assembly type approach to climate questions um, and, and we see this in the energy sector you know if you say to someone do you want a wind farm at the end of your road they might say well no thanks but if you sit people down and say how would you like to tackle climate change? Would you like uh, to not drive or not fly or eat much less meat or have a wind farm at the end of your road? You know, maybe then they will say, you know, I quite like the idea of a wind farm at the end of my road. So I, I think, you know, presenting our citizens with, with the options is perhaps a way of cracking some of these, these things that politicians find it obviously very difficult to, to, to address. I think that's a very wise proposal. I will, this is one of my takeaways today. Um, it's a bit of a pedagogical approach, but yeah, I think that's what we also need. Uh, Teresa, you pointed out on the question that we haven't tackled at all. Uh, we're, we're speaking about reduction of consumption. We're speaking about the change of diet, uh, using less land for, for uh, food production. So we have land for giving it back to nature, for biodiversity, or even for other produces. Uh, um, please uh, please uh, take the floor on that, Teresa. Uh, yeah, um, just to say that as as I think Harriet was also alluding to, uh, I mean, the the threat to biodiversity, to forests, the role of ecosystems to play in sinks um, will, of course, be dependent on how we are using the land um, and what we're growing. And I think a lot of the land that we use globally, and I apologize, I don't have the numbers to hand right now, is not being used for food. We know that actually right now we use more land to grow feed than we do to grow human food. But a lot of land is also being used. And, and you know, as I say this someone, as someone who likes chocolate, but, you know, I, but I also recognize that there are perhaps um, many crops out there which are, um, which we need to understand are, we need to treat as luxuries um, rather than staples because, because they do have a lot of land implications, particularly sugar, cotton, well, biofuels, feed, um, flower industry, how really necessary is that and how much water and resources does, does that all use? I mean, if we really want to make the maths, the land maths work, we need to start thinking about um, how, we, how we value that land and how we want to prioritize it for good, safe food production within planetary limits. Thank you for that intervention. Marco, please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give the figures because we, we, we published a study about it with the figures from the agriculture. So of the European agriculture, the entire European agriculture area, livestock occupies 71%. Okay, So 71% of all the agriculture area we have in Europe is dedicated to the grasslands to feed them or producing feed. When it comes to arable land, we use 63% to produce feed in Europe, to which we need to add 50 million hectares that we use abroad because of all the imports of 30 million tons of soybean every year. 
so that that is that's why I get mad when we discuss this because it it looks like ah you uh, you're a vegan because you talk about livestock. Uh, first of all, I'm not. I eat meat. My kids eat meat. We eat only organic meat, but that's a different thing. It's not because we we want the world to become vegan. It's because if we use over seventy percent of something which we have to manage, we have to discuss and decide how to deal with that. We cannot treat the problem as, ah, you are an extremist, because I am not. I'm actually only reporting what the IPCC is saying, what Cambridge University is saying, what Oxford University is saying, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's a magnitude issue. It's a magnitude problem. And we have little by little to keep raising this issue and convincing the decision makers that we have today, which so far have not been reactive to that, to address the problem. Also because the sector itself, those that earn their life producing livestock, will be very soon confronted with un impossible conditions because there will be an increasing uh, change in the consumption patterns because millennials are doing it already and they will become adults. So it's better to, pre to be prepared and to accompany the sector where we need to be instead of just facing, you know, hitting a wall in, in a few years time. Yeah, right. Good argument also towards the farming sector. Uh, change in time or you're left behind. And, and, and that, that the old question on meat and the dairy consumption is not an ideological question, but it's just the facts, the pure facts of amount of land use uh, that, that uh, uh, point in that, in that direction, yeah? uh, and that uh, show that this is a key part uh, of the solutions. Uh, I think we're coming closer to, to an end. Uh, so um, if, if any one of you wants to make a final point, uh, then feel free to indicate to me. Otherwise, uh, I will try to wrap up um, first of all, agriculture is a huge part of the climate disaster today. So it's a, it's a huge contribution uh, to, the, to the global warming and to the CO2 and other climate gas emissions that we have. We have seen that changes of agricultural practices, but also forestry practices, can be puzzle stones of a solution, but they are not the solution as such. So we will not get away uh, and be able to get away from rethinking our consumption patterns uh, uh, in, in that session today, primarily linked to consumption. Uh, but I think we had mentioned cotton uh, and another fiber. So it's maybe also about the amount of cloth that we use and all of that. So we will not be able to get away from rethinking our uh, consumption patterns if we want to be able to, go to, to move towards a climate neutral society. Uh, I think that was very clear from today. And we need to make sure that we don't uh, sacrifice our biodiversity uh, uh, to, let's say, wrong solutions or uh, solutions that very much come also from the industry while well, the industry tries to make money. So they lobby as much as they can for the perfect circumstances uh, to, to make money. But we, we need to face that a lot of arguments that are put on the place harvest more wood, use GMOs, uh, 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 glyphosate is, will, will rescue the climate and all of this, that this is a lot of fake news that we are confronted with and that these are not probable solutions uh, to actually uh, tackle the climate crisis. Um, I want to thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, I hope we were able to actually tackle all or most of the questions that you participants have risen uh, very down to the point uh, questions. We had an earlier question on, well, who will be our participants and will they, will they have, bring some knowledge? And I'm sure we had uh, participants that are reading a lot and uh, bringing in a lot of knowledge by themselves already on that topic. So thank you very, very much, Harriet. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much, Teresa, and thank you very much, Marco, for your engagement, for your work in the civil society organizations you're working for, uh, and for the very precise and very interesting contributions you have given to us. And a big thank you to all the participants that have stayed for one and a half hours uh, with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here, for your interest. And as I said, you will be able to uh, re review uh, that session next week on our homepage if, you're, if you are interested or share it with your friends. See you on another occasion.
uh, stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all doing the best to save the world. See you soon. Bye, Thanks bye. so much. Thanks, so Thanks much. very much, everyone. Bye. Thank all you best. all.